This webinar is brought to you by IMRS Houston Gulf Coast Branch. Our speaker for this webinar is Ali Sedeno. Ali is the founder and president of the Women Offshore Foundation. She is a 2008 graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and a 2020 graduate of Rice University's Jones Graduate School of Business with a master's in business administration. She is licensed as a chief mate of unlimited tonnage vessels and dynamic positioning operator. Ali's experience on the water spanned both maritime and offshore energy industries over the last 12 years. Her latest vessel was a seventh generation ultra deep water drill ship built in South Korea in 2017. For our global viewers, please note that this webinar is in listen only mode. Please ask questions in the Slido link provided in the Eventbrite invitation. These will be read to the speaker for answers at the end of this presentation. With that, I hand over to you, Ms. Sedeno. You have our full attention. Thanks so much, Christine. Thank you for the warm introduction. It's wonderful to be with everyone today. Again, my name is Ali Sedeno, and I'm the founder of Women Offshore. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization supporting the careers of female seafarers around the world. And today I'm pleased to share with you my experience founding Women Offshore and what I've learned the last three years to empower the next generation of female leadership. I wanna start out with a story. I wanna take you back to the year 2005 when a female cadet was out at sea and she had just joined a ship. She was very excited. She had realized that, you know, this was her second sea year. She already had experience on a previous ship and she was here to learn. She remembers that very first day of joining the ship climbing up the gangway with all of her gear, her heavy bags, going to her room, putting on all of the PPE that she needed to wear, finding the chief officer who she would work with directly over the next three months, and, and feeling pretty good about herself because she knew exactly where to go to find him. She went to the cargo spaces, and approached him. He, he was having a meeting, so she stood in the back, and he sees her and says, who are you? And she introduces herself as the deck cadet, that she's there to learn, and she's, you know, excited to be there, and he tells her to get out of his face, that he does not want to see her, and that he specifically asks for her not to be there. So she hears this, goes out on deck, and over the next several months, she has a very difficult time. She's not in an inclusive environment. She's specifically told since day one that she does not belong, and she internalizes these experiences, and it really takes a hold of her confidence and drags her down. Fortunately, this deck cadet was me. This was my experience as a cadet when I was a student at the United States Merchant Marine Academy. And if you had talked to me back then about what I would have done differently or how I was doing, I would have just told you that I was getting through it and that I was going to move on and that I was fine. But I did struggle. I struggled a lot. However, I loved being at sea enjoyed navigating large ships and I enjoyed the studying involved in becoming an officer. And so I went on to sail for 10 years when I graduated. And I went all over the world. I went down to Antarctica. I went to the North Sea. I, I went everywhere and I saw some amazing sights, met some great people. Even though there were challenges throughout my career and times where I often felt that I did not belong, did not see myself as being a captain one day. I still tried and I really needed a role model looking back. I needed mentoring. I needed someone who was a female that, who I could reach out to. It wasn't until about 10 years after that experience I shared with you being a cadet 
that I got on a vessel where there were several women. There were so many women that I, I noticed that the guys didn't really care that I was there. Whereas before I would get lots of comments about myself, maybe my body. Instead, I wasn't this anomaly walking down the deck. There was gonna be another woman walking down the deck right behind me. And really there were just about 10 out of 150 women, but it felt like a lot. And I found this sense of belonging, this camaraderie I'd never known. And I think the women and I, we, we mentored each other, got really close with another mate who would work with me a lot, as well as a female engineer. And in this environment, I thrived. That sense of belonging meant that I wanted to go to work every hitch, that I enjoyed it. And I was ultimately promoted. When I was promoted, another opportunity came around. And that was to go to a brand new drill ship being built in South Korea as a senior dynamic positioning operator, where I would be the senior person on the bridge in charge of station keeping on a brand new drill ship. So I took that opportunity. And when I was there in South Korea, again, I was the only woman and I enjoyed the crew I worked with. A lot of those guys I had worked with for several years and we had you know, a good time in shipyard, but at the same time, I really missed that camaraderie I had found on that previous vessel. So each night after working 12 hours in shipyard, I would go back to my apartment and I would speak with the women from my previous vessel and the mentoring continued with them. I remember thinking one day that this is how the industry should be, where you have that kind of inclusive environment on board ships, where it doesn't matter what your gender is, what your race is, that you are accepted for being you. And I wanted that kind of environment. However, I'm just one woman with a computer and making all that change sounded very daunting and I thought, well, maybe I could create a website, a website where women could connect, we could share resources, and we could come together when, when we could uh, to empower each other. So womenoffshore.org came about, and I started by reaching out to the women who were on my previous vessel. They were going to be the first role models on the website. These women had great stories of successes and challenges that they had overcome. And I soon realized that these sea stories could be tools in women's back pockets so that ladies who come out of maritime academies, universities, who are just starting out in the industry, they could look at these role models and the sea stories that they offered and learn from them so that if they were in a similar situation, they might know how to navigate that a little bit easier. From the sea stories, I, I interviewed so many women and, and they asked for mentoring. And I'll go into a little, I'll go into that a little bit more in a few minutes, but I realized that we needed to have some sort of formal mentoring program for women who work at sea. So that no matter what kind of ship they work on, no matter where they are in the world, they could be down in Antarctica or up in the North Sea that if, as long as they can connect to the internet, then they could reach out to a mentor or mentee. I also decided to create a podcast and we have the Women Offshore Podcast. You can find that on most podca podcast apps. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. And I share stories with women from around the world. And we've also had several men on the podcast. I recently interviewed the Maritime Administrator, Admiral Busby, and ladies from our community got to ask the questions. I didn't want to be the only one asking the questions on that episode. So I gathered questions from the community and they each got to ask about whatever was important to them. So if some ladies asked about the state of the U.S. Merchant Marine. One lady asked about what to do if you are experiencing sexual assault or harassment. So it's a very candid interview and we appreciate the Admiral coming on the show to share his, his points of view. We've also had some events. So we had our first event back in 2018 and our last one in 2019. And 
We were really hoping to have a conference this year. However, with COVID-19, we've had to rethink that. And we've started to put events online, such as what you guys have here, which is great. Uh, we're going to have our first virtual event live on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages on Thursday to honor the day of the seafarer, which happens every year on June 25th to recognize the contributions seafarers make to the world's economy. And this year is especially important because a lot of seafarers are stranded right now on vessels. And you probably have seen in the news, there have been some suicides by seafarers who are stuck at sea. I've seen seafarers who have, have been on their vessels for a year and they're celebrating that a milestone, um, but I'm sure there is a lot of anguish and it is very difficult for them right now. Some of my friends went out to sea for what they thought would be just a couple weeks and they um, have not been able to come home and they're out there for over a hundred days. So you can imagine that these virtual events, anything that we can put online for them is very important to thank them for what they accomplish each and every day. Going back to the podcast, you know, events, virtual events can't always be streamed out on the ships. But what's great about a podcast is you can put the audio out there and most of the time it can be downloaded on very slow internet connections. So whether that person's coming in out of port and they decide to download it then, or they try to download it when they're at sea, they should be able to access it. Another evolution that we've seen at Women Offshore is going back to the sea stories. And these sea stories are so important that we've decided to put our social media in the hands of other women. So we've been doing this for about a year now, where every now and then we have a woman take over our social media from Instagram, and then we share to Facebook and LinkedIn. These posts are raw, they are real, and these ladies get to share who they are and what is important to them. They get to share their stories. And it's just absolutely fantastic hearing from them and li literally giving them the con, the control of our social media so they can just tell the world what their experience is like. I'd like to next talk to with you about some of the important areas that I've seen over the last three years. And I'd like to start with mentoring. So mentoring matters. And I've read a lot about mentoring and how it's a hot topic. And a lot of women feel that everyone wants to mentor them now because it's been encouraged so much. And there's actually been a st step away from mentoring more towards sponsorship. And that's very important too. So with mentoring, you are providing advice. As a sponsor, you're providing opportunities. So if you see that there's a job available for someone that you're mentoring who would qualify, you put the, a good word in for them and you show them that there's this job opportunity. However, when you're in very male dominated environments, women in mentoring, especially when they're isolated at sea, it's not always an opportunity, especially if you go to a ship like where I was, where you were not wanted. So it's important that we have these mentoring opportunities out there for anyone who wants it. We first learned this in an online poll, which we did with our community back in 2018. And we found that 67% of our community wanted a formal mentoring program. Going back to those C stories, constantly heard from women how they wanted mentors. And I also heard from women who were reading the stories and they wanted to connect with the women in the stories so that they could learn more from their careers. Our mentoring program for the last couple of years has had approximately 150 women in it. And I'm pleased to share with you today that we are about to expand that to 250 women. So we have some criteria here where we really want it to be just women because we only have so much money and, there, and there's a lot of demand for our program. Um, we'd love to expand it to include men as well who are passionate about advocating for women, but we're not there yet. 
And then we're looking for women who have experience at sea to be mentors. It does not matter if you went to sea 10 years ago and you've been doing something else for the last 10 years. We want you as a mentor because you've been there, you've experienced it, and that's what matters. And so when we have a mentee, often it's a woman just emerging into the industry or a woman who has just graduated from a maritime academy. She's going to be looking to you to understand how you navigated your career and what, how did you make some of the decisions you made. It's great hearing about some of the success stories around our mentoring program how women were able to make big jumps in their career. And another thing that's really surprised me about the mentoring program is just how I will have a woman who's an experienced female seafarer sign up and she, she literally wants to be a mentee, even though she has lots of experience. And I think it's important to recognize that the women within our network, they're constantly looking for growth and opportunities they're going out there and trying to accomplish their career dreams. And no matter what age they're at, no matter what, how much experience they have, they just want more. They love this industry so much. So we must mentor women. And there are some things that I learned on why we must. And that starts with why, with women don't ask. This is something that we have to deal with in society, that we are taught from a very young age that women don't ask for what they want. It literally starts with the storybook characters, the fairy tales, where a woman has to wait for a prince to come rescue her. And life happens to her, not for her. We, this is ingrained in us. And so as a woman, or as a girl grows, as she get, becomes a woman, she has all these messages telling her not to ask. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that don't like it when women do stand up and ask for things. So we have to deal with this as women and mentoring is important to encourage women to ask, but also to set an environment where women will ask. And if they don't, you tell them, please ask me a question. Like, what do you want? This is an environment where you can ask those questions. If you wanna learn more about why women don't ask and what you can do, there's a book I'd like to recommend to you. The book is called Women Don't Ask, The High Cost of Avoiding Negotiation and Positive Strategies for Change by Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashever. Sarah Lash ever actually came on my podcast to share this book and uh, some of what's in it. And so you can also listen to the podcast to learn more. A confidence gap exists. And I see this a lot where women just don't think that they can do it and constantly telling them to go after it. I'm sure you've heard of the study that says that women will not apply for something unless they feel 100% capable or more, 100% or more. Uh, but men will apply with 60% of the knowledge and the experience. So we try to encourage women to go for these big jumps. We highlight women who've made huge career jumps from offshore to onshore. We showcase what that is women who become captain, what does that look like? Your very first hitch as captain offshore to showcase that, hey, yes, you can do it. A story that I can share with you was there was a woman who approached me and said, hey, I want to work offshore. And, you know, I said, oh, that's great. I, had, I know a company that's hiring right now. And this was before COVID. This was last year. And I said, let me connect you with the recruiter. I think they'd be very interested in your background. So she uh, messaged me a few days later, said that the recruiter had called her and that she just did a terrible job. She said, you know, it just, it didn't go well and she was just embarrassed and thanks for the opportunity, but I'm not good at these type of things, she said. And I said, oh, you know, it's okay. I understand. And then I got an email from the recruiter maybe an hour later and the recruiter said we loved her she's great you know we're really excited to move forward with her and, and continue on with that the application process and, and hopefully get her hired so i went back to the woman who had said to me 
that, you know, she, she didn't think she did a good job and just encouraged her to apply. And she's been offshore for, for about a year now. And, and she, she loves it. She's doing very well. Lastly, why we must mentor women, fitting in can be costly. It's not only costly to the individual, but it's costly to the company. So first with the individual, thinking back on the story I shared in the beginning, it can be costly because I really lost a lot of confidence in myself. And I actually had to build that back up as I went along. Even though I was only gonna spend a few months on that first vessel, I spent eight months at sea that sea tide. So I went to my next ship with hardly any confidence. And I remember the chief mate on that next ship pulled me aside and this was towards the end. And he says, I'm really proud of you and everything that you've accomplished. I can tell that something went wrong on that last ship. And you know what, you seemed like a beat dog. I remember those words, a beat dog. However, you have really thrived here. He worked on getting me to believe in myself. He gave me lots of responsibility and I'm grateful that he was able to see that in me. It can also be costly to the company. We wanna make sure that people that are coming to our vessels, they're coming to our businesses, they can bring their true selves. What's the point of having a diverse workforce if people are not being who they are, thinking the way they think and being free to give that opinion, those thoughts so that they have in a way that will be accepted. We want to make sure that we mentor women so that they feel that they can come forward with what's important to them, especially if they're in an environment where it's not as inclusive as it should be. I'd like you to think about what expectations you can set for gender parity at your organizations. There are several things that you can do at your companies. You can drive your strategy with diversity and inclusion. It should not just be from the top down. Let's think about how we can create an inclusive environment within our organizations from the bottom up. This is very important because a lot of what I see that happens, especially around sexual assault, sex sexual harassment, Unfortunately, the people that often have the biggest effect on the victims are those at the lower ranks. And so we wanna make sure that the inclusion is throughout the entire organization, that people are understanding and supportive of others in that environment. Targeted recruiting is also important. I hear from companies that, oh, well, the women just don't wanna work offshore. That's not, that's not true. It's absolutely not true. There are lots of women who want to work offshore, that want to work at sea, that want to work in these male-dominated environments. They're out there. And so it's important that HR is going out and they're targeting these women who will be there long term. A focus on retention. This is both in and out of maritime and offshore, where companies are providing family planning opportunities where you can decide as a woman that you want to have your eggs harvested. And when you have that kind of control over your life and your company is going to help pay or pay for all of that process, you can go out there, you can have a, you know, a career at sea. And then when you're ready, even if that means into your forties that you decide, okay, now's the time to have kids. You've planned that already and you have built up a successful career that then you can pivot shoreside or, or whatever you would like to do with that. That's part of retaining women in the workforce. Formal mentoring programs are also important. When I started it just as one lady with a computer, I went out and raised some money, raised about $12,000 from the industry. Um, my sponsors have stuck with us the last couple of years, which has been great. And helping us continue to grow the program. The program that we use to uh, maintain our mentoring program is called Mentor Loop. They are out of Australia. They provided us fantastic service and have really understood the importance of online mentoring programs when you're spread out around the globe, such as we are. Um, and it's especially important during this time where most of us are having to connect virtually. Women's events are big events. 
time and time again, I see that women's events are, are small group things and then they only include women. And it's, we got to change that. We have to include men. And, and I do believe that there are times when women's events should only be women's events um, because it's important that certain topics and, and certain things are, are discussed with women so that they have that understanding, that genuine understanding, but they shouldn't all be that way. We need to have men involved because in male dominated environments, when it's about 98% men, we can't open all the doors, ladies. We need men to be there. We need men advocating for change along with us. So let's bring them to the events, have them speak alongside us and show them what they can do within their organizations to push that change even harder. Coveralls and uniforms are another very important concept. It's actually a safety hazard when you don't have women's coveralls that fit their bodies. And this doesn't just apply to coveralls, also boots and someone else as well. Coveralls are important because if you're wearing a glove, for example, and it doesn't fit and you move your hand and the glove slides off, you're not protected. And while that's a very simple uh, way to explain it, that's the reality for a lot of women out there is that the gloves don't fit. I remember wearing some coveralls and I was doing everything I could to shrink them in the evening in shipyard because they didn't, they didn't fit me. And that can be a safety hazard trying to climb up stairs and you're stepping on the pant leg um, and it, it's just gonna trip you up. So it's important that we have coveralls that fit women's bodies. It's also important that we have coveralls in our inventory that fit women's bodies because it sends a message that this is an inclusive environment, that because we have coveralls here in the inventory, we expect women to be here. So that when a woman does ask for coveralls, it's no big deal. Time and time again, I hear from women that they don't want to ask for things, right? We talked about that earlier. Women don't ask. You're setting it up easier for women to ask so that they don't feel like they're standing out by asking for something special when we have it to begin with. And then men and women as event speakers. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but no matter what kind of event it is, whether it's a women's event or a general event, let's try to see more women in these in these speaking positions. Too often I see uh, conferences is all men. Let's get some women up there. We know that they're out there. We know that they're doing great research. We know that women are leading companies. Let's try to see more events where we have men and women as the event speakers. In the end, this list that I've given you, it sends a clear message that normalizes women in the workforce and up the ranks. And that is the key. We need to normalize women at sea. We need to normalize women at our companies. We should no longer be seeing the women accomplishing being the first of anything. I don't wanna see that anymore. I wanna see women as the expectation and we need to normalize that. We need to normalize it. And that list on the left of your screen is a start on how you can do that. And some of these things, don't require much more effort than what you're doing or, or even more money. Another thing I would like to touch on is men as advocates. And I spoke a little bit about that earlier, but please, if you are a guy listening to this, thank you for being here. It's so important that you are listening and you're learning and think about who you can mentor within your circles, whether that's your community at home or your workplace or both. What can you do to sit down and listen? And unfortunately, because of the Me Too movement, not all men feel comfortable mentoring women. And it, I get that. But at the same time, we need you. We need you to mentor. We need you to sit down with women and simply ask them, how are you doing? What can I do for you? And provide that opportunity. And as you mentor and you listen and you give advice, look for opportunities to sponsor. And if you wanna take it a step further, Catalyst provides these advocate groups called Men Advocating for Change, Real Change, Mark. And these groups are ways for men at your organizations to come together under frameworks to advocate for women within the workplace change that they want, but maybe don't know how to implement. 
from what I've heard, these groups by Catalyst have been very successful in bringing men from across organizations together to make it more of an inclusive environment um, at their workplaces. And then please attend women's events, ask if you can attend, because even if you can't attend the event in the near future, I think asking will set a really nice message and you may be able to attend um, sometime in the next year. Today, I ask you to make a personal commitment, whether that is to mentor, to seek gender parity within the initiatives that I, I've given you, or be a male advocate. Please, what can you do today? Set that personal commitment. And uh, ladies, if you know a guy in your workplace who is a great advocate, please thank him. Let's encourage that and do it publicly. Thank you, that's all I have for my presentation. It's been wonderful speaking with all of you and I think now we'll go on to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Allie, for your, thank you so much, Allie, for your great stories. Um, I really enjoyed the, the bit about the companies having gear that fit women. I remember when I was in the North Sea, I was presented with two dry suit choices for the helicopter ride to the west of Shetland. One fit too, too tight in the thighs and the other was too loose in the neck. I chose a suit that was that fit in the, in the neck so that water wouldn't <laughs> come in. It should, we have an emergency situation, but it meant I was a penguin walking into the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> So some, we have a, a couple of really good questions here. Um, the first one is, is there anything specific about the marine sector that makes it more challenging for women? I think some of these you may have already gone through, but if you have anything else to add, and is it more psychological than physical, i.e. harassment versus PPE? Yeah, those are some good questions. So first, I mean, it's a challenging, industry for anyone for whether you're a man or a woman being gone is very hard especially if you are a planner and i know a lot of women who want to plan out their entire lives they want to have families and so when they're trying to see themselves going to sea, they they don't see the connection between having a family and and having a seagoing career so providing opportunities and putting them out there where maybe you work at sea for a couple of weeks at a time and then you uh, work in the office or you go home and the, uh, schedules like that can showcase that, hey, you can have more of a balanced lifestyle. Um, putting stories out there of women who have families. I know of women who work at sea and, and their moms. And I know of one in particular who's been pregnant offshore a couple times. So her, she has a strong support system at home. Her husband, he also works, but their family um, helps support the kids when she's at sea. So there, there are some barriers there that I see that women women have that, that make, it, make it really tough to, to see themselves in a long-term career uh, on the water. Um, but I think there are things that we can do and that, that's showcasing more opportunity. And um, as far as like the mindset versus PPE, um, the PPE is not really a challenge until you're out there and then you realize that, that it is a struggle. Um, but the, the mindset around sexual assault and sexual harassment, it is there. And, and, and it's real, it's very real. And I talk to women, unfortunately, all too often who've experienced sexual assault or sexual harassment and uh, other people hear about it, of course, and or perceive that that might be the case. And it's important that we provide support where it's needed and showcase that, you know, you could possibly have this challenge, but companies are putting their foot down. They they do not accept it. They won't accept any retaliation either and that you will be supported and you have a lot of people championing you if you want to go to sea and just providing that support. And, and companies also have to get rid of people who, who unfortunately assault and harass. And, and we see that a little bit where people will get moved around. Um, and I understand that not everything's clear cut but we need to make sure that we're sending women out into inclusive environments and men. It should be an inclusive environment where everyone feels safe. 
Thank you. The next one we have it. What is your forecast about presence of remarkable numbers, say 10 to 15 percent, as opposed to the existing 2 percent of women seafarers at sea in the future? It's going to take a while. It's obviously going to take a while. That's a really good question. I do see some companies coming out with quotas. And that is a very interesting thing to talk about. And I've had some discussions with people of color, um, other women who don't want to be a part of a quota. And I get that. That makes a lot of sense. And you can feel alienated, marginalized, even more so if you are viewed as part of a quota and maybe that's only why you're there. But in business, if things aren't measured, they don't get done. And if you have a very male-dominated industry like, like maritime, you kind of need these quotas to push the change to get everyone on board. And, and once you get to that 25%, it's a lot easier to push the needle towards the 50%. And so it, it is happening at some companies that have set quotas for 25% and, and they're slowly getting there and, and they're doing a great job. It just takes time. I, I don't know if I can put a numerical forecast on it, but it will take, take a while, but we're starting to see that push and that change for it. Great, and to follow up on that, there's. It might be the same question and you might have a different way to answer it, but do you think there's scope for companies to create proactive recruitment strategies that ensure there's always more than one woman on board? Yeah, I think some things that can be done around that are being aware of where the women are in your fleet. And while that sounds very simple, I see women go out to ships and they're, and they're the only woman. And maybe it's really just... Uh, an issue around availability, but why couldn't that woman go to the ship where there are already women on board? Why does she have to be the only one there? And then when you have a vessel that has no women, I think it's important to send the more experienced female seafarers there who've already been in that kind of environment rather than the new woman to the industry, um, which is something I see a lot too. Great. Um, can you tell a little about DPO and how DPO from a normal seafarer and how many ranks are there? Okay, so a dynamic positioning operator, that's what a DPO is. And you are uh, basically a mate still. You like third mates, second mates, chief mates can work as DPOs. So you're on the bridge, generally working a 12 hour shift and you use a computer system to keep the ship stationary. It is so much fun. When I learned about what a DPO was, I wanted to train for it. And I got a trainee position back in 2010, I want to say 2009, 2010 uh, on a dive support vessel. So with this dynamic positioning system, we could follow an ROV around. Um, we would get right up close to a platform and you were just monitoring screens you have all these inputs, ensuring that you stay on location. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. If you have the opportunity to get on a dynamic positioning vessel, please do. And uh, you'll learn a lot. And it'll be a great thing to add, not only to your resume, but just your life experience. Great. Um, there's an, another one, a question. To, she says, I am in a workplace currently where women's overalls are not provided as there are only two of us who require them. How would you go about asking for this? Yeah, that is a really good question. And I'm really glad you asked that. So I would definitely talk with your supervisor about the route within your company to make that change. Talk to you if you have some sort of materials men on board, some sort of warehouse, whoever's in charge of that, see if it's a, there, it's possible to order. Cause it may already be, you know, approved vendor within your system who can order those for you. So I would definitely work with your supervisor on that. If you have any pushback, definitely bring out the safety case on that, the importance of why you need it. It's not about looking good, it's about them fitting you. And I've seen, unfortunately, some pushback on getting women's coveralls claiming that, oh, well, the women just care about fashion. 
like, no, I care about my safety and efficiency. It's so much easier to work in women's coveralls. I went offshore last year around this time and I wore women's coveralls for the very first time. And I was just amazed by how much easier it was to do my job because I didn't have all this extra fabric hanging on my body. It was just easier to move around. I didn't care what I looked like. I was going out there to get dirty, but it was about safety and efficiency. And I would, I would talk about that with your supervisor and, who, and as high up as you can get at the company, especially if you know an executive, talk to them and, and they'll probably want to hear from you. Thank you. The next question is, do we know of any other industries who have overcome gender disparity and how did they do it? Yeah, so that's a good question. I look at the airline industry um, as well as tech to see what they've done around that. Um, and they still each have a long way to go. Um, the mining industry, look at these others and, and just try to observe, see what kind of initiatives are coming out. But it, it, it's hard. A lot of diversity and inclusion initiatives don't work. They don't work when they're forced upon people. You need to ingrain it in part of your culture and show that inclusion is, is how we do things. So I, I wouldn't say that we have an industry to, to model after, but you can look at other industries and see what went wrong, right? See what went wrong to not do that, to not copy their mistakes and, and learn from them as well. Great. Uh, so there was one uh, question that asked about, was there an aha moment when you realized that you can in fact meet all the challenges? And if you just want to, you may have brushed through some of this in your chat earlier, but if, if, if you wanted to describe more about what that moment was. Um, if there was an aha moment, I think it just kind of built up in me over time where I struggled and then I had successes and I realized, you know what, I'm here to stay. This is what I want. I want this career. People are gonna talk no matter if I do well or if I do poorly. So I'm just gonna realize that I'm giving it my, you know, my best effort and that's what matters. And the guys make mistakes too, but they're not talked about as much I've noticed. So just keep working hard and you'll get to where you wanna be. Um, how, one of the questions is how, how do women seafarers, what are some recommendations to help women seafarers make balance in their family life with professional life? Again, you kind of summarized some of that earlier, but. Yeah, I think family planning, offering that as an opportunity is very important so that a woman, so I'm in my mid thirties, right? I'm going to turn 35 next week and I haven't had kids. So I am going to go back offshore for a couple of years and I'm in the process of figuring out my family planning. And I'm at the age where if I get my eggs harvested now, then I will have healthy babies whenever I want them. Most likely there's always the, the risk, but I'm setting myself up for hopefully success. And so now I can go offshore for a few years. Um, or longer, however I'd like. And I don't have to worry about the top, the clock ticking. I can go out there worry-free um, once I have my eggs harvested. So I never really thought I would be talking about this on a webinar, um, but here we are, 2020, and I think it's okay. Um, but it is an important part, offering that as a benefit to women so that they can put the the clock in their control and then not have to worry about when they'll have a family. Showcasing women as role models who are moms and work at sea is also really important to showcase how they do it, right? How do they balance the family? And then another thing that helps is the work rotation. So if a woman works at sea, maybe she's gone for months at a time and you know that she wants to have a family, ask her to apply for maybe an auditor position where she still goes to see, can utilize her skills and her experiences, but she only goes out for a week or two weeks at a time to audit vessels, and then she works in the office. So I think 
there are opportunities around those, those three things I just said to um, encourage women to, to, to balance that life between having a family and working at sea. Great. Um, so uh, the Vanessa asked question, I'm going to adjust it a little bit, but what can you describe a couple of technologies that are specific for women that are used right now in the offshore industry? Um, technologies, sorry, technologies around what exactly? What technologies are used right now to help women who work in the offshore industry? Um, so I guess I can answer that to talk a little bit about the rig floor where, you know, everything's pretty much automated now for working on the rig floor on a drill ship. So whereas before it would be more about the brawn and how much you could lift, now we're very restricted on what we can lift when we work with equipment and moving things around. And it, it's less about that brawn. So that means that there are more opportunities for women um, and not that women can't physically necessarily do the things of the past, because I know a lot of women could, um, but it's providing more opportunities now for even more women to get up on that rig floor and, and do the work. And Allie, just to clarify too, when you said we can't lift this, you don't mean women, you meant riggers. Everyone, 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 From yeah. Safety perspective or whatever. From safety perspective, yeah. So there are companies put requirements on how much people can lift. So whether that's 50 pounds, 25 pounds up a flight of stairs. Or, so it, it's important that we stick to those guidelines so that people do not get hurt. Um, I'm part of a STEM, I'm part of STEM girls in my college. I'm probably the oldest girl student in, my co in the college and I'm extremely agree to educate man, men on the process of education. Yeah, so I think I can answer that with, I view support of women as a spectrum. So you have people on one side that are extremely supportive, they're all in, and then you have people on this side who are adamantly against women's rights, women working offshore, specifically in my world, women working offshore. And then you have all these people in the middle. So when you're looking at trying to get at this side, don't worry about it. Because a lot of those guys over here, they can't be helped, unfortunately. They, they're set in their ways and it's not your responsibility to show them, to educate them. What I focus on are the people here, the side that support me, to the middle. And then by having an effect on those people, they will have an effect on people over here. And it's often the men that have the greatest effect on people over here. So we talked about men advocating for change. That's another thing. We need those men in the middle to really step up and speak up because they're going to have an effect on the guys over here. So if you're looking for ways to educate Men, um, look at the middle. Awesome. Well, I think that's about the end of our question. So you had a really great go at all these questions, Ali. Um, and I think it was a great program and it was, the questions are great and it sure was fun. Um, before Thanks. we say goodbye, I'd like to remind all of our viewers that IMRS um, Houston branch also offer a CPD to viewers. Um, who CPD to viewers attending this webinar to the end. So if you need a CPD, send an email request at the end to the event contact email provided to you on the invite. Thank you, Allie, for sharing your story and thank you to all the viewers who joined in and participated. Thank you so much.